Good to see everybody today. Let me uh, do some announcements. Give updates, fill in. First of all, uh, my first posting on letting us all know that we're going to live stream, uh, I was under the gun of getting ready for Cindy Bunny's funeral and making a decision and so on. Anyway, I've had several people contact me and say, are you okay? <laughs> because I look stressed. Plus, I was dressed in a suit, which is never. So uh, anyway, yeah, I'm fine. I'm fine. And uh, I just want to kind of update us a little bit, let us know kind of what, uh, what's going on. Uh, last, let's see. Okay, I got to remember what week we are. So essentially, a week ago yesterday, uh, we got a message from Zach, uh, our children's pastor, and saying that uh, he had tested positive for COVID. So that kind of started us on the journey. And uh, so we took care of uh, truck or treat, which went very well. Uh, we had about, I think about 380 people come through on truck or treat. And uh, we enjoyed doing it in the parking lot the way we did it, it worked out well. So then, uh, so we just, you know, captured that moment. And then uh, when everybody came together on Monday, uh, we were just practicing uh, mask and distance and so on, making sure everybody uh, kept, you know, good things in place. Anyway, Monday night, our uh, Secretary of Faith and our custodian, Jennifer, ended up uh, being symptomatic. And they both tested uh, positive. And uh, for Faith, uh, it's possibly her husband. Zach's family, Lindsay has it. His two uh, son, Caleb and, and Grayson both have it. Anyway, long story short is, is that all of a sudden I had my team actually uh, being uh, taken over by this COVID thing. Now, previous to that, I had several families that actually came down with it. Uh, and so it was becoming an issue anyway. And then when it happened to the leadership, uh, I kind of did a talk with the staff and a talk with the deacons. And we decided to pull back and to go to live stream. So... Is he doing something behind me? <laughs> anyway, uh, so bottom line is, is that uh, as it stands right now, we're going to live stream the next two Sundays, okay? Uh, and we didn't, you know, we, we don't have perfect communication to everybody, so we've actually had to send some people home or somewhere else, but told them, sorry, uh, we, di we didn't get the message to you. So, you know, it's important for us to have your... Uh, email for you to be on our Facebook if you do Facebook and uh, also to have your phone number because we use those things to actually communicate to everybody. So how is everybody doing? Well, uh, everybody is okay. Uh, neither Court nor Winona nor Jason nor myself actually uh, picked up uh, what was going around. And so uh, we're thankful for that. But I just didn't have enough time to make sure everything was safe. Uh, as in symptoms and testing and whatnot, to be able to get to uh, make Sunday happen. And then on top of it, our area is really having uh, a lot of cases and a lot of our folks have been affected. And so we just need to kind of pull back a little bit and, and take it easy. So that's where that is, okay? Uh, we suspended our activities. Um, the one thing that we did, well, the two things that we actually did do is that uh, we had um, the funeral for Cindy Bundy, which I just could not in my mind consciously say we're going to have to cancel that. Um, that'd be a double blow. So uh, that went, went fine, and we're very sorry, and just uh, be praying for the Bundy family. Uh, but also, uh, we carried on with uh, what is called Day of Hope, and so essentially, yesterday here at our church, we served hundreds of people in a f outdoor, distance fashion and uh, met a lot of needs and shared Christ and prayed with them and so on. So several hundred people were here in our parking lot again yesterday. And uh, so <clears throat> going forward, uh, we're just doing live stream. We will uh, receive our Operation Christmas Child uh, boxes, and I hope you have uh, decided to be a part of that. Uh, we have some boxes here that you can pick up. 
We have definitely boxes that you can make. Uh, I believe Hobby Lobby has those, and you can go there. You can make your own shoe box. But uh, Operation Christmas Child is still going to happen and still being picked up the 16th through the 23rd. Um, I would go through the, the times, but honestly, it's a little too hard to get all those details explained. But 16th through the 23rd, we'll be receiving those boxes. It will be outside. So you don't come inside, you'll just come out, out front and uh, drop off your boxes and get those out there. Uh, we have basically just about everything else has been kind of suspended right now. So uh, we'll, we'll work on that as we, as we go along day to day. Uh, we were gonna, we, we'd already decided we weren't gonna have our Thanksgiving dinner, but we are gonna have it in January, if everything's good. Uh, so just tell your taste buds to hold on and we'll get to them later, all right? So we'll see what happens there. Today I wanna talk about what the Lord really cares about and what is one of the most important things. Um, have you ever lost anything? Yeah? What'd you lose? Keys. Okay, people lose keys all the time. Your phone, okay, yeah, phone, that's another one, boy, woo-wee. Uh, the other day, uh, I thought I lost my phone. I was out running errands for the church and doing things and so on. And uh, I, I uh, no, actually, it wasn't my phone, it was my wallet, which as a Dave Ramsey guy is not a good thing. So uh, wandering around, you know, and then my son calls me about four hours later and says, uh, hey, Dad, I got your wallet. <laughs> I was like, ah. <laughs> I was all over town. You know, anytime you lose something very, very important, you can't think about anything else until you find it. And that is, that is a fact. And so I want us to take a look, if we could, at Luke chapter 15, where the Lord uses parables to be able to explain to us how important the lost are. How important something lost is to the Lord and to us. And so I wanna take a moment to do that today and, uh, you know, the lost being found, that's the big deal. Now, when I found my wallet, I felt really good. When you found your phone, did you find your phone? Yeah, you were good. You know, you found your keys, it was good. As a matter of fact, don't they sell stuff? And there's apps, of course, for your phones, for your keys, you know, and you can push the button and beep, 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 and you can find it. So, you know, this, this thing of, of losing something and finding it is a big, big deal. Uh, I kind of lost my son Seth when he was young, out in the woods one time. Uh, technically, he wasn't really completely lost, but I couldn't find him. And so, um, and then that got me in a lot of trouble with his mom. So, you know, uh, when we found him, we were, she was especially excited. I was like, get in here, we're in big trouble, okay, come on. So. You know, there's, there is no doubt that this is a, a easy thing to understand for you and I. But I want us to take a look at Luke chapter 15, verses 1 through 32. Luke 15, verses 1 through 32. And uh, if you're having trouble seeing the scripture on the screen, turn in your own Bible. I use the ESV almost always. The ESV almost always. Why do I do that? Because I can trust it. Other uh, translations have had some diversion and some uh, what I would call deception. They're not transliterating. Uh, they are actually commentating on things, and so they're changing the Bible to match their ideas. ESV does not do that. Um, chapter 15, verse 1. Now the tax collectors and sinners were drawing near to hear him. So this is who's gathering around Jesus. Not necessarily just at this particular moment, but also uh, in general. So imagine people who don't have anything to do with God are drawing near to God's Son to hear what He has to say. That's a beautiful thing. I mean, that, that would make anybody happy. And so they're drawing near. Now look at verse 2. Here's the contrast. And the Pharisees and the scribes, what? Grumbled grumbled. 
Uh, that word is throughout the Bible, by the way. You want to do a Bible study on grumbling. I don't think you have to do it to learn it, but you have to do it to actually learn not to do it because we all naturally grumble. But they grumbled. They grumbled because sinners, dirty people as they saw them, uh, those who were not religious, those who didn't practice the, the rules and the rituals uh, of religion, uh, they actually found these folks, sinners and tax collectors, deplorable. I remember one time I baptized a guy. This is a long time ago. He had an earring. I never really thought that much about it. I was just really excited that he had turned his life over to Jesus Christ and, and was being baptized and that he was uh, going to follow the Lord. And so uh, when I baptized him, afterwards, one of the fellows in the church, significant fellow in the church, he came up to me and he said, does that guy have an earring in his ear? I said, yes, sir, he does. He said, which ear? I said, I don't remember, nor do I care. You know, here's the deal. Here's the deal, okay? Um, the Lord loves sinners. And the idea that the sinners are out there and the good people are in here is actually a misnomer. And even if that were true, those in here who have experienced the grace would be excited to see those who need the grace to find it. But that's not what these folks are doing. These Pharisees and scribes are grumbling, saying this, this man receives sinners and eats with them. When I first came to pastor this church, I, I warned the church that they may see me actually go to bars. And I have, I haven't lately much, but I have gone to bars. And uh, the reason I wanted to warn them is because, by the way, if they see me walking in, guess what? They won't say anything to me. What will they do? They'll tell everybody else, you know. Oh yeah, I saw Pastor Day walking in the bar, you know. Now, just so you know, if I did actually have something to drink in there, it would be in the can so that they would know what it was. I would never put it in a clear glass. But irregardless, the bottom line is, there's this idea, this sort of sense that we have to separate ourselves from people that need Jesus. Well, that's exactly the opposite of what Jesus is all about. Last Sunday, you may or may not know, but I preached actually on the sower, the seed, and the soils. And the fact that uh, we are to sow seed everywhere. And especially so that those who would receive it can be saved by it. And uh, it tells us that there are wonderful things that will happen. But notice, Jesus is receiving sinners and eating with them, which is another way of saying He's having them over to his house. He's having fellowship with them. He's close to them. He spends time with them. He's, he is actually relating and being with sinners. Verse 3 says, so he told them this parable. So now Jesus sees what they're saying, okay? Sinners are coming. Religious are complaining. And Jesus says, I got a story for you. I got a story for you. And this is what he says. What man of you, having a hundred sheep, if he lost one of them, does not leave the ninety-nine in the open country and go after the one that is lost until he finds it? Now, the rhetorical answer is what? They all do that. Okay? Have you ever heard a parent say, when they lose a child, they can't find a child, well, I've got five others. You know, I mean, you're bound to lose, you know, 10, 15%, surely. Nobody ever says that. Nobody ever says that. The fact is, is that um, when that one cow, that one lamb, that one child, that one person, you do not say to yourself, well, I got a bunch of other keys and I've got some other phones. No, you go after the one that's lost. So friends, I want to point this out to us, okay? Don't forget what the church is about. The church is about finding the lost. We are called a search and rescue mission. 
That's what we're about. And when he has found it, he lays it on his shoulders rejoicing. And when he comes home, he calls together his friends and his neighbors, saying to them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep that was lost. Now notice this, verse 7. So just so I tell you, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents. Okay, so let's, let's, let's get this cleared up here, okay? Uh, we like to sing, but the thing that should make us sing the most is lost people finding Jesus Christ. Lost people finding Jesus Christ. That should be our song. That should be our joy. That should be what we celebrate the most. Who repents. Now notice, I want to point this out. Salvation begins with repentance. Jesus Christ came and said, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. I want to point out, lost being found involves sinners repenting. The reason I bring that up today is because there are so many people today that are making a Christianity does not, that does not exist biblically, a Christianity that there is no repentance, that there is no sin, that there is nothing wrong. I've said this and I'll say it again and I'll keep saying it because I think we need to pay attention to it because it affects so many people today. There is only one wrong in the world today. That is to say something is wrong. That's the only wrong there is. You can't say that. You can't say somebody's wrong. You can't come with certainty or boundaries or correction or rebuke. You can't tell somebody that they miss 13 out of 100, okay? Folks, we are called to call people to repentance. We must repent. If you've never repented, if you've never turned from yourself and your sin to your Savior, then of course, there is no being found. You are still lost. But regardless of that, let me go on to bring where we're at here, and that is lost people repent, and that makes them saved and found. And that's what this parable is about, is about the one out of a hundred repenting and being found, and that the church should rejoice, and that people should rejoice that a sinner comes in. Uh, Here's one of the things I notice about sinners. Uh, They come in the way they are. So sometimes you have to say, you know what? Uh, You might want to wear a little more clothes. Or you say, hey, you know, uh, why don't you think about what you say? (laughs) You know, Uh, I, I, you know, I don't know how to put it, but there's a lot of things that we don't do as Christians that new believers have to work on. And so that's another thing is that there needs to be a sense of patience and a a consideration because nobody comes perfectly and nobody actually stays perfect. But we call people to actually come to Christ and to grow. So nobody walks over to a field and tears it up because the plants are only little. The fact is, is that you give them a chance to grow. And that is another part of the pleasure of a church. The found grow. But notice... This passage is talking about the 99 who need no repentance. Or what woman, this is another one, what woman having 10 silver coins, if she loses one coin, does not light a lamp and sweep the house and seek diligently until she finds it? The answer is, everyone does that. Okay, have you ever lost a bunch of money? Huh? My mom gave me My mom's passed away, so I'll say this out loud. My mom gave me thousands and thousands of dollars because she was afraid her husband would find it. And he would take it to Las Vegas and lose it, okay? Because he'd already done that with $250,000. That's the truth. Anyway, the fact is, is that my mom gave me this money. Well, to my chagrin, which means to my disappointment, I lost it. I could not find it. I didn't just say, oh, shucks, (laughs) move on. No, I tore up 
my office, my cars, my house. I did everything and anything I could do. Now, after I'd gone through all that work, I called my mom and I said, Mom, I got, I got some really bad news. I said, Mom, you know that money you gave me to keep so that Kenny couldn't see it? She said, yeah, I lost it. She said, that's all right. It was just a cashier's check, David. <laughs> I was like, oh, you can replace that key? <laughs> you know, anyway, the bottom line is rejoice because <laughs> the money was found, you know. I thought it was lost, but it was found. And it, the point is, anybody who loses something, they are deeply involved in finding it, and they don't rest until they do. That's for us as, as a church. And when she has found it, she calls together her friends and neighbors saying, rejoice with me. For I found the coin that I had lost. Just so I tell you, there is joy before the angels of God. So you want to know what makes the angels sing? Is when one sinner repents and comes to Christ. That's the song of heaven. That's the song of heaven. There is joy before the angels of God over one sinner who repents. And he said, there was a man who had two sons. All right, there was a man who had two sons. Watch this. And anger into forgiveness. And in these Jesus communities, all outsiders are welcome. Yeah, good news for the poor. That's one of Luke's main themes. Yeah, you'll find it all over this section. The marginalized people that he heals, the shamed sex workers he reaches out to, the tax collectors he includes. This is Jesus's kingdom crew. And Israel's religious leaders watch and start to criticize him. If he really is God's prophet, why is he welcoming sinners and eating with them? Yeah, this section reads like the battle of the banquets. So Jesus throws these dinner parties as a symbol of how God's kingdom is here for the sick and the poor, people who could never pay him back. Jesus also attends banquets with Israel's religious leaders. Yeah, and he lays into them for becoming an arrogant, exclusive social club. But they don't get it, and so he tells them a famous parable that goes like this. There was a father who had two sons. The older son is trustworthy and honors his father. And the younger son, he's a mess. He rebels and cashes in his inheritance to travel far away and blow it all on partying and being stupid. And then there's a famine in the land. And he runs out of money. So he has to scrape by by taking care of somebody's pigs. And he's so hungry, he wants to eat the pig slop. At which point it occurs to him, if I'm going to be a farmhand, I might as well go home and work for my dad. At least I won't be eating pig food. So he treks back home, rehearsing his apology. Now, the father is certain that his son did not survive the famine. But then, one day, he sees someone walking down the road. It's his son. He's not dead. And so the father runs to him and embraces his son, kissing him all over. The son starts his speech. Dad, I don't deserve to be your son. Maybe I could come and work for you. But before he can finish, the father calls his servants to go get the nicest robe, new sandals, a fancy ring for his son. They are to prepare the best food for a banquet. It is time to celebrate. Now later that day, the older brother arrives from a long day working in the field to discover his long lost loser of a brother has come home and they're celebrating. And he gets angry. And think about it. He's been faithful to his father all of these years. He never got a party like this. And then this disgrace of a family member comes home and they're going to celebrate him? It's disgusting. He refuses to join the banquet. So the father finds the older brother outside and he says, Son, you are already in our family. Everything I have is yours. But we had to celebrate your brother because he was lost. And now he's found. He was dead. But now he's alive. Jesus wants the religious leaders to see the outsiders the way God sees them, as sons and daughters that are being reclaimed from death. Jesus' kingdom community was wide open to anybody. The only entry requirement is to humble yourself and recognize your need for God's mercy. And so the religious leader's rejection of Jesus and his crew is actually a rejection of the God of Israel. The leaders don't like all of this, and so as Jesus' road trip comes to an end, the conflict is at a boiling point. Yeah, he's going to ride towards Jerusalem. Jerusalem for Passover as they plot to take his life. And that's what the next section of Luke is all about. The reality of the importance of illustrating these two sons. Now, a lot of times people think actually this parable is about the prodigal son, but it's actually about the eldest brother. And that's actually what these parables are about, really. They're really about the eldest brother. So think about this. 
It's really about us. Not the lost, it's about us. What is our attitude towards seeing people come to Christ? What is our activity? What, is our, what are our actions? So Jesus says, a father had two sons. And the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of property that is coming to me. And he divided his property between them. Not many days later, verse 13, not many days later, the younger son gathered all he had and took a journey into a far country. So, you know, there, there's some, some really, you know, uh, important nuances in this parable. Uh, you know, God's given you everything. Everybody in the world has been given life. They've been given breath. And uh, they don't necessarily recognize God or God's place in their life. Uh, the fact is, is that this father gave his son everything and his son took it and squandered it and left him. So th there's, a, there's a certain sense that this parable really does have you know, a deeper meaning. But the fact is, is that he leaves and squanders his property in reckless living. And this is something I want to point out. There is reckless living. <laughs> there is sin. There is sinfulness. There is a need to be saved. There is a, a need for the lost to be found. There is a need for a soul to be redeemed. And uh, there is a hell. There is a hell. There is a heaven. And it can only be procured through calling upon that name which is above every name. The name by which only name anyone can be saved. The name of Jesus. And I want to encourage us to remember this, okay? Because my friends, you need to take a look around. And not just see sinners being sinful. The lost being lossful. But to understand that there are people that need the Lord. There are people that need the Lord. There are people that need Jesus. And that is our work. That is our work. And so this is important as he looks at it and he sees his son leave. And when he had spent everything, okay, a severe famine arose in that country and it began to be in need. I will say this. I don't believe that people will come to Christ nearly as much if there's not a need for hope and help. So I'm getting a little encouraged because things are rough and they have to be rough for people to even start thinking about who they are, why they're here and where they're headed. And uh, I, I believe that, that the, when people feel the need, so we say it as, you know, they, they hit the bottom or they, they, get, they find themselves in a, in a, in a hole or they, they find themselves really, really despairing and so on. Look, folks, I'm telling you right now, there's no money that's going to make people happy. There's no sex that's going to make people happy. There's no food that's going to make people happy. There is no place or position or power that's going to make people happy. We see it day in and day out, day in and day out. And I want you to know something. There's 195 countries in this world. 195 countries. And every one of them needs a Lord. Every one of them. And most of their leaders do not recognize the Lord. And yet there are still believers in those 195 countries, even in the literally 50 some countries where there is absolutely no freedom. That is actually where the gospel grows the most. So you know where the church is growing the most, right? China, China. Now I know China is a bad word right now and they're not doing good things to us per se. But the bottom line is, is that that's where more people are coming to Jesus. Just remember, their country is not only not good to other countries, their country is not good to them. And they need the Lord and they're finding the Lord. But notice this. So he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country who sent him into his fields to feed pigs. And he was longing to be fed with the pods the pigs ate. And no one gave him anything. Verse 17. But when he came to himself, I love that line. When he came to himself, man, I've had those moments in my life, you know, coming to Christ, yes, but even after coming to Christ, I've had moments where I came to myself. 
You know, I've had moments in, in my family, in my, in my work, in, in my neighborhood. I mean, uh, have you ever had to go and apologize? Hello? Yeah? It's important. It's hard. Hard to apologize. Hard to recognize. But I'm going to tell you, salvation and any other work of God in your life always comes to coming to yourself. Waking up and coming to yourself. But when he came to himself, he said, how many of my father's hired servants have more than enough bread, but I perish here with hunger? I will arise and go to my father, and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned. So let's be clear about how salvation actually takes place. How does the lost get found? How do the dead come alive? How does the unsaved get saved? Well, they have to recognize the need for a Savior. They have to recognize the emptiness of not having the Father. They have to come and say, I repent, I confess, I turn. This is very, very important. This is very important. Now, I want to I tell you something. You know, I've always uh, heard about and dealt with what they call jailhouse religion. And it's an issue. Those who work in the prisons and stuff, they know, they see it. They see people being real religious, but they don't really see them changing. And then they're back, of course, you know. But the bottom line is, is that I have learned that people that are in jail who really find Christ, they don't get religious, they get real. <laughs> and they say things that they don't have to say, and they say things that even cost them their freedom or maybe, you know, uh, their money. I mean, they don't care anymore. They don't care anymore. They're willing to say the truth, you see, to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help me God. So I have learned that uh, things really change, and one of the things that changes is that the, they no longer keep up the lies, they no longer, you know, hold back the truth. They don't just show you what they want you to see, they show you everything. And uh, another thing that kind of happens is that their, their conversations change, uh, what they put up in their, their cell changes, their communications with other uh, inmates changes, their respect for the guards and the, the leadership changes. You see, everything changes. Why? Because they truly repent. They truly repent. If people are just trying to change their circumstances, that's not repentance. That's not salvation. You have to have a complete, born-again, new heart. You have to turn. So when he comes to his father, he says, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. Against heaven and before you. In verse 19, it says, I am no longer worthy to be called your son. This is important. You can't repent if you don't recognize your sinful condition. You can't be found if you don't know you're lost. You can't come to Christ if you don't recognize who he is and why you need him. And this is so important for people's lives. Uh, Jason, do you mind? Show that baptistry right over there. That baptistry is uh, fired up. It's got water in it. It's being heated. Uh, you might hear a little weird sound every now and then. That's the uh, jets making a little sucking sound over there. You know why that baptistry is filled and ready to go? Because people are coming to Christ and we're baptizing people. That's why. And what are they doing over there? Well, they're not getting a, a bath. They're getting a burial. A burial is dying to yourself. You're dead. Now, when you go through that water, as in you confess and repent and come to Christ, you are alive for the first time. You're alive for the first time. And I want to point this out because you see, he says, I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me as one of your hired servants. <coughs> Verse 20, and he arose and came to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and felt compassion and ran and embraced him and kissed him. Now, this emphasizes how much the Lord is ready and willing for you to come to him. Look, all you got to do is take one step. He'll take the rest. All you got to do is take one step. He'll take the rest. But that one step's hard. Hard for me to say, I have failed. Hard for me to say, I am a sinner. 
Hard for me to say, hi, my, day, my name's Dave Mason and I need God. Hard to say that. But boy, once that's said, everything else starts happening. Everything else starts happening. So the Lord came and actually met him. His father came and, and grabbed him, embraced him, kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy. Be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Bring quickly the best robe and put it on him. And put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet. Now notice, he's giving him all the things that he deserves as a son that he had already given him and he squandered. Okay? Uh, that's called forgiveness. That's called restoration. That's called redemption. That's called being adopted. Being born again receiving what you do not deserve. And that's why it's called amazing grace, because it saves a wretch like me. Father, I've sinned against heaven and before you I am no longer worthy. But he gets the robe and the ring and the shoes and puts it on his feet. And bring the fattened calf. Now, personally, I like that part. Uh, if I'm going to eat a calf, I'd prefer it to be fattened. <laughs> okay. That's just a personal preference. Sorry. But anyway, maybe you want a vegeta vegetable meal or something like that, you're a vegetarian. But the bottom line is, I like flavor, and uh, there is no flavor uh, if there isn't some fat. Just remember that. Anyway, he brings a fattened calf and kill it, and let us eat and celebrate. For this, my son was dead. Notice that. Verse 24, dead. If you want to know why the world walks around like zombies, why they spend so much time medicating themselves. Spend so much time trying and trying and trying and trying to find a way to be happy. It's because they're dead, spiritually dead. It's not that they're in the wrong country. They're under the wrong political system. They don't have something. The fact is, is that all people are dead. Without God, they're dead. Without the infusion of of the grace of God to be covered in the blood to be born again they're dead for my son was dead and is alive again amen isn't that beautiful uh, that's why like I say you know it's really hard for me because when somebody tells me and they really confess I just I get a grin on my face I get, a, I get happy I get excited because I know what's about to happen they're about to be saved Okay, they're coming to Christ. They're good. They, they were dead and now they're alive. They were underweight and now they're going to be set free. They were laying on the ground and now they're going to fly. I mean, the fact is, is that it's a beautiful thing to see the heart of a human being changed by the one who made them and brings them to their true inheritance and gives them what they do not deserve. For my son was dead and is alive again, he was lost and is found. And they began to celebrate, verse 25. Now his older son was in the field, and as he came and drew near to the house, he heard music and dancing. And he called one of the servants and asked what these things meant. What, what's the party all about? What, what, what's, what's the need for all the celebration? And he said to him, your brother has come, and your father has killed the fatted calf because he has received him back safe and sound. But he was angry and refused to go in. His father came out and entreated him, but he answered his father, look, these many years I've served you and I never disobeyed your command. Now notice, he is about to reveal something about what he believes, and that is that people get what they deserve. That is not how life works. We don't get what we deserve. If your father or mother takes care of you, that's a gift. If you receive something, that's a gift. There's no such thing as right, as in you deserve everything. No, it's a gift. Now, I'm not... I'm not saying that all systems and all situations and all circumstances, but just understand this. God gives us 
grace. Unmerited. Unmerited. Undeserved. Can't buy it. Can't work it. You get it by true confession. It's a gift. So the bottom line is, is that this guy is telling his dad, I've done all these things, meaning I deserve. I deserve. Friends, one of the temptations for a believer is once they come to Christ is to begin to think that somehow or another they deserve and actually have earned what it is that they have. And that is a sheer mistake. Sheer mistake. You want to know one of the, one of the things that really is, it, it just really bothers me. It's really difficult. There are lots of people who have talent. And they might use that talent in the church or among Christians. But you see, that talent isn't what they're about. And that's why you often find people who are talented actually turning away from the faith or compromising the faith, or you find out they've got a double life because you see they're living by what they have and not by what they don't have. And that's why we come to God. We don't come to God because we're so talented. We come to God because we're so lost. And so they come to Christ and they, they find the salvation. This brother has lost the sense of how he became a son and how he was cared for and how he was taken care of. And the, the bottom line is, is that parents don't have children because they're good. They have children because they love them and they take care of them even when they actually turn away. But this, this gentleman has got it all mixed up and so do religious people. Religious people have a tendency to begin to think you gotta talk Christian, act Christian, and all these things, and that's really what it's all about. So we circle the wagons, and everybody outside of the circle is not deserving. Instead, actually, we're supposed to take those wagons and go after everybody outside the circle. We're supposed to go and seek and find that which is lost. His father came out and entreated him, but he answered his father, look, these many years I served you, and I never disobeyed your command. Now, that's not true. <laughs> that's, that's a lie. Okay? How many of you are perfect? Okay? If you raise your hand, you just became imperfect. <laughs> because the fact is none of us are perfect. Yet you never gave me a young goat that I might celebrate. Now, what is, what is this guy doing? He's jealous. He's jealous. You know, one of the things I have seen in the church is that sometimes people begin to think that they are what the church is about instead of the lost. And if you don't show them the kind of attention that they think they deserve, as in you spend more time on finding the lost and actually being with the frozen chosen, the fact is, is that uh, people get upset. Well, that reveals something. The heart of God is for the one that needs to be found. The one that needs to be found. My friends never got to have this party. Verse 30 but when this son of yours came, now notice whose son it is. It's your son. Not my brother. Not my brother. It's your son. All right, there's a, there's a, a true understanding of separation. But this son of yours who has devoured your property with prostitutes, you killed the fattened calf for him. Verse 31, and he said to him, son, you're always with me. Now the father lets him know, I love you. I love you. You're important. You're special, okay? But but what is mine is yours. Verse 32, and this is the thing we need to understand. It was fitting to celebrate and be glad for this brother, this your brother. Notice how the, the father turns around and says, your, your son. And he said, no, your brother, your brother was dead and is alive. He was lost and is found. We are staying on top of a story a lot of you are following this midday. Virginia Beach police and family members are still looking for a woman and her two children who disappeared after their house caught on fire over the weekend. No one has seen Monica Lamping, her seven-year-old son Kai, and her nine-month-old daughter Araya since Saturday night. We have just learned search and rescue teams are at her house right now. 10 on your sides, Maria Elena Beloris is on this story for us today. And Maria Elena, we understand you spoke with Lamping's ex-husband just moments ago. 
Yeah, Katie, I literally just walked out of their house. I was talking with Kevin Lamping and his wife, Myra. Kevin is the father of seven-year-old Kai, Monica's oldest son. He was actually in Jacksonville working with the Navy when he heard the news and he came home as soon as he heard. And they said initially when they heard what was going on, they weren't too concerned. They were thinking maybe Monica's phone died. But once they learned that Monica had not been in touch with her parents or her best friend, Anne, they became worried. Now, I spoke with Anne and Monica's mom yesterday, and everyone I've talked to has told me the same thing. For Monica to leave like this, that that's not like her. And the moment when they realized Kai was not in school yesterday, that was the turning point. They say Monica always made sure Kai was in school and on time. And now as their fear just continues to grow, they're hoping the kids are with their mom and are safe. We just have a lot of questions that, that we're going nowhere quick. And with every hour that passes, that, that feeling um, of helplessness certainly grows and a uh, feeling of despair is, is also there. Now, the Lampings confirmed to me that Monica's car was seen around 2 o'clock in the morning on Sunday at the downtown tunnel heading west. And Kevin also told me, like we said earlier, that a search and rescue team is at Monica's house now. He just left to go over there, and we are headed there as well. We'll bring you any updates on this story as soon as they become available. In Virginia Beach, I'm Marielana Boloris, 10 on your side. A lot of you are talking... So notice that's a search and rescue team. A search and rescue team. That's what we are. We are a search and rescue team. And I want to encourage us to think that we need to kind of get back to getting some marbles in the jars. Okay, what, do I, what am I saying? Well, each one of these marbles we've used to put in the jar every time you share your faith with somebody. Every time you tried to sow a seed and to see someone come to Christ. These are marbles that we put in jars out of, the, out of the bowls into the jars because that is what we're about. We're a search and rescue team. We're a search and rescue squad. And the fact is, is that my friends, we have Amber Alerts. When somebody's lost, put out an Amber Alert. We interrupt hundreds of thousands, if not millions of people to be able to say, look out, somebody's lost. And so I just wanna emphasize to us, folks, without Jesus Christ, folks without salvation are lost. Your neighbor, your family member, your coworker, somebody you do business with, somebody you see through the day, they are lost and they need to be found by the gospel of Jesus Christ. So I wanna encourage us to remember that. And here's a song that was written a long time ago. Softly and tenderly, Jesus is calling, calling for you and for me. See on the portals, he's waiting and watching, watching for you and for me. Come home, come home. Where do you think this was inspired? Earnestly, tenderly, Jesus is calling, calling, oh sinner, come home. Oh, for the wonderful love he has promised, promised for you and for me. Though we have sinned, he has mercy and pardon. Pardon for you and for me. Come home. Come home. Ye who are weary, come home. <coughs> Earnestly, tenderly, Jesus is calling. Calling, O oh sinner, come home. Come home. Come home. Ye who are weary, come home. Earnestly, tenderly, Jesus is calling. Calling, O oh sinner, come home. I just want to remind us, okay? This is what we're about. We're about a lost lamb. We're about a lost coin. We're about a lost son. We're about lost people. That's what this church is all about. If you drive by the church right now and take a look, you'll see a banner that we put up, and this is what it says. Turn, the word, number two, and in big letters, Jesus. Turn to Jesus. My friends, this needs to be our message. This is what we're about. And I wanna encourage us to remember, okay? Don't get the elder brother attitude. Don't get the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the scribes attitude. Don't get the religious person's attitude. And that is, I'm okay, you're not okay. No, that's not the message. The message is, he saved my life, he can save yours. Please come home. Amen? Amen. 
as we sing this song, you think about where you are in terms of Christ in your life. Have you ever repented and confessed and received Christ? Or if you have Christ, are you reaching for the lost, trying to save those that need to be found? Are you doing the things that Christ called us to do? Get the one coin, the one lamb, the one son, the one person that needs Jesus Christ. As we sing, you decide.